So we are selling meatball sandwiches today, and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about fasting on a day that we're selling meatball sandwiches. I was just discussing with Valentina that it's a, it's a, it's a, the sandwich is a trick. It's a trick sandwich. No, it's not. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more here a little bit later about what we want to do as a church uh, and fasting. And that's what we are talking about that today. And some of you are thinking, did you say fasting? I thought you said feasting. That's why I'm here. No, it's fasting. <laughs> it's fasting. And it's not very popular. It's not a very common thing. And um, it's, it's kind of fallen out of... Uh, it's fallen out of popularity in terms of churches that are preaching and teaching it, and it's kind of where we are. But here's my text for today, um, and it's not all-encompassing, but it's important. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18, it says this, When you fast, do not look sober or somber, however you want to pronounce that, depressed, basically. Don't look discouraged. You're not you're not putting a show on as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. And, and, and be truthful. Who oils their head in here? Come on, tell me. No? Nobody? All right. At, at the time... Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, at the time, um, cosmetics, cosmetics were, were a little different than they are today. But what he's saying is basically... You know, you, you, don't, you don't announce it. And that's not a secret. It's not a secret that you're fasting to honor God. It's not like if somebody finds out, it doesn't count in the eyes of heaven. No, it's not like that. But at the same time, he was just telling them, do this, do it for the right reason, right? When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. Why? And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So before I go any further in talking about fasting today, in this message, I want to say this. Fasting is all about doing it for the right reason. It's all about doing it with the, with the right motivation, with the right reason. And so you are free to eat a meatball sandwich today because the all-church fast does not begin technically until tomorrow. And again, I'll say that closer toward the end, but just as by way of intro, just let me talk about a couple people in Scripture. Moses, right? Moses, the lawgiver. I love Moses. You know, he always, he always felt inadequate. Humility was one of his, he had a speech impediment of some kind. Never put himself above where he needed to be. He wasn't perfect. He got angry. You know, he had a temper. He did. Uh, but, you know, in, but in Exodus chapter 33, Moses is the only person that's ever seen God. And he didn't even get to see his face. If you read the scripture, you'll see that God put him in a cleft of a rock and covered him. He said, you can look at my hand. And then when my glory passes by you, you'll see my back. Do you know what I think? And, and remember the story, when Moses comes down off the mountain, he's glowing. All he saw was his hand covering, and then his back, and he's glowing. Talk about power. Let me move on. That's Moses. Let me move on, right? King David, Elijah, the prophet, Queen Esther, Daniel, the, another prophet, Anna, the prophetess, the Apostle Paul, Jesus himself, all of them had something in common. They had more than one thing in common, but for today's particular thing, it's one particular factor that's in common. They, they did this, they practiced this discipline. What was it? Fasting. Fasting. Old Testament, New Testament. It does something to the heart of God. It does something. So, listen, we've come away from it in modern times. It's not, I'm not sure why. Some people see it as new age. Some people see it as a little weird. You can get weird with anything. Anything can get weird. And, and, and so I, it's considered by some health advocates as a healthy thing to do. You know, where's, a, where's Amanda? Yeah, next, next American Ninja Warrior over there. I guess people fast for health reasons. I, I think. I don't know. So there's, there's some good re But those, none, of those, none of those reasons are reasons to fast, nor to get someone's attention and make it look like you're holy, oh, I'm fasting today, right? Which is exactly what they were doing in the New Testament in Jesus' time, right? Maybe, fast is, maybe, maybe fasting is uncommon, and we'll talk about what it is in a second here. Many of you know already, have an idea at least. 
Maybe because we're a kind of a self-indulgent society. We eat three square meals and snacks in between and whatever. In truth, we're very indulgent. We are. We don't, we don't deprive ourselves of much. We don't, we, don't need a new, we don't need a brand new, you know, hunting crossbow, but we want it, so we'll get it. Do we need the new pair of shoes? Or do we want them? Because you don't need them. Wow, did not expect that response, but okay, thank you, ladies. Do we need that new car, or do we simply want it? Do we need the newest iPhone? Well, you do if your old one drops into the sewer <laughs> in Galloway. <laughs> that's an inside joke, but that's okay. But do we need the latest of the latest and the newest of the new? We don't. We want it, but we don't need it. Do we need the two-pound steak, or is the eight-ounce sirloin good enough? Actually, we do need the two-pound steak. No, we don't. We don't. We don't need it. We don't. New clothes, more makeup, hair products, cosmetics. Come on. Come on. Ladies, do you know how much, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars are spent in that kind of stuff? Cosmetics, stuff like that. You're beautiful the way that you are, honestly. How many, how many curling irons can you own? All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out my wife right now. Again, oh, she loves it when I preach. I know she does. She actually listens to my sermons, so I'll hear this. I'll get. She bought something over Christmas for herself, <laughs> which is fine. There are these weird little tendril thingies that apparently you twist into your hair, and, and they, like, make curls or whatever. So she comes out looking like a Martian, like an alien, scared me to death. And I'm like, that's beautiful, honey. I have no idea what she's doing. There's always something new. There's always something different. And it's, it's, it's just, it never ends. We, and I'm not saying that she's self-indulgent. I'm just saying it never ends. There's always something else. There's always something new. There's always something that we want. Even, even people, and some of you are thinking, you know, maybe you should invest in some cosmetics, Pastor. It might help you. I get that. I get that. Listen, so even with financial problems, even people with financial problems have this strange demeanor, at least in this country, where we are, for all intents and purposes, a bit spoiled, if you're honest. Even those with financial problems have this strange demeanor with, of, I deserve this. So whether I can afford it or not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it. Okay. So we're a self-indulgent people. The people that I mentioned, the people that I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, Moses, Daniel, etc., Esther, Jesus, they're all individuals who are fasting, and we're going to do this together starting tomorrow. And so I just want to start very quickly. Let's talk about this. Number one, what is it? What is it? Throughout Scripture, in simplest terms, in simplest terms, fasting is referred to as you're not eating. You're abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. It's a spiritual, it's not a hunger strike. You're not making a political point. There's no agenda. It's not a diet plan with health benefits. That's not, you don't, you don't merge the two. You say, well, I'm, I'm doing this for this reason, so I, I guess it's spiritual. No, it's not. Fasting is with the express intent that you are depriving yourself of food or whatever. We'll talk about that in a second. To honor God. It's a spiritual discipline. And it's, if, in the way scripture describes it, it's a powerful tool that we've been given. And we're not using it. That's just the truth. I don't mean to be harsh at all this morning. It's a spiritual gift. It's a tool. It's a resource that we've been given that we don't often use. Why? I don't know for a number of the reasons I mentioned before. For a number of the reasons I mentioned before. In Scripture, the normal means of fasting. There's different kinds of fasting. It just, but the normal means of fasting involves not eating food, no solids, but you, can, but you can drink water. It depends on how long you're going to do this for. Because we use, we use wisdom. So for example, a normal fast would be, I fast for a day. I don't eat from sunup to sundown. But I drink water that day. If I, if I don't want to drink water that day, that's honored as well. It's, it's, all, it's, it's not what you're doing. It's why you're doing it. Moses, in fact, did not eat or drink water for 40 days. That's a miracle. That's not advisable. You talk to your doctor if you're not going to drink water for even four days. Because that's about the length of time a human being can go without water. You can go days without food, but you cannot go longer than three, four days, even up to a week in, in extreme situations without water. But water, and Moses did this not once, but twice. No food, no water. That is a miracle. That is not normal. 
That was God doing that in Moses, right? In Luke 4, 2, right? In Luke 4, 2, we know that Jesus did the same thing. He fasted. Jesus he himself fasted for 40 days. We're told he didn't eat anything. It doesn't say that he didn't drink, though. He might have had a spring of water nearby. Maybe he didn't drink. I'm not sure, but it doesn't specify. It doesn't specify whether he ate, whether he didn't eat at all, or whether he didn't eat and he didn't drink either water. And he was hungry at the end, obviously. Either he had water or God sustained him through it as, as he's able, right? And there's other fasts. And the reason you say, why would Jesus fast? Why would Jesus, of all people, why would Jesus, does he really need to fast? He was setting an example. And the principle, the dynamic, the power that comes through fasting was also there for him. Remember, he became in all ways man like us. Yes, without sin. But Jesus faced temptation, and before he did that, he fasted. What's it mean? He's saying, look, there's power here. There's power here. There's a stirring that happens in God's heart when you do this. That's what he's saying. That's why he did it, right? So that's what fasting is, right? There's an absolute fast. There's other fasts described. Daniel. And Daniel, obviously, the, the description was a little different. Daniel ate no choice meats. He didn't eat choice meats or breads or that. He, he, they ate legumes and vegetables and, and, and drank only water and all of that. And at the end of that period of time, Daniel and his friends were what? Healthier than everyone else. They looked healthier and they looked stronger and they were in better shape than the people that weren't. So a Daniel fast is something that you can do. Again, it's not about health. It's not, this is not a health project. This is, this is honoring God and depriving yourself of something. It's in the simplest terms. That's, how it, that's what it is. Number two, what does Scripture say about fasting? What did Jesus say about fasting? Well, there's some debate over whether or not fasting is a command, whether it's an, 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 an ordinance or not, like, like uh, communion would be, or water baptism. Where, where, Je where is Jesus saying you have to do this? Or is it a good idea to do this? Well, uh, listen, he, he tells us to take communion. He told us. That's a command. It's an ordinance, right? It's not for salvation. It's because if you love me, you're going to be obedient. You're going to do what I ask. If the sheep hear my voice, they're going to know who I am, and they're going to do what I say. That's, that's communion. That's water baptism, right? And there's some debate over whether fasting is an ordinance or not, right? Is it a requirement? There's a lot of scripture that deals with fasting, but two of them stand out. I'm just going to read them real quick or talk about them very quickly. First of all, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 to 18. Matthew 6, what we just read. I believe fasting, I, be, I honestly do. I believe that fasting is as much a part of the Christian life as tithing, as giving, and as praying and reading the word. Fasting is a part of the Christian life. That's my belief. That's my belief. I can't say, thus saith the Lord, because thus did not say the Lord. Right? He didn't put it that way. But when we read the scripture, it says, when you fast. Not if you fast. It did say that. Pretty good indication, right? So then as you come in, I, 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 don't, I can't say conclusively. I'm certainly not going to form an entire theology around this. I'm not, right? But it is a good and common and valuable resource for a Christian that wants to read through Scripture and say, if this is for me, I want it. It's the same thing as the gifts of the Spirit. So a lot of people say, oh no, that's not for today. Dispensationalists. I'm just saying this real quickly. There's, there's some people that call themselves dispensationalists. They were a lot of gifts and a lot of things in Scripture, but they're not for today. Why not? Who told you that? Who told you that? If God has a gift for me, I want it, whatever it is. And if there's a resource like fasting that's going to create intimacy and power in my life, I want it. I want it, right? So although Jesus said when you fast, he didn't say you must. That's fine. Second Scripture, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 14 and 15 says this. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often? Remember the Pharisees? That people did, that the people that did everything they did to be seen so that they could show everyone how holy they were, right? So John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and, your, and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples don't fast? It, it should have been a no-brainer if they knew who Jesus was. In verse 15, Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom, that's Jesus, mourn while he's with them? How, who are they fasting to? It's Jesus is right there with them, right? The time will come when the bridegroom is taken from them, and then they will fast. That's what Jesus tells them. 
The time's coming when I'm going to be taken away. Then you fast. And guess what? The fasting will cease when Jesus comes back. And he is coming back. And I hope there's an urgency there. And we'll be talking about late, that later in this year. We'll be doing a series on that. Let me move on. So yes, Jesus upheld the practice of fasting. And yes, he expected his followers, that's us, to do the same. And to do it when he was gone. And he's been gone. And we fast. Maybe it's, a word, maybe it's the word command that gets us all messed up. Because in our flesh, when somebody says, you have to do this. How many just love it when you get like a new tax law or, or somebody at work says, you, you have to do this. Oh my gosh, it just rankles, doesn't it? it just, even if it's easy to do, you're like, I don't have to do anything but die. That's it. It's all I have to do. Actually, in, 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 in death and taxes, right? There's not... Listen, <laughs> Jesus never commanded fasting, but why wouldn't you want that gift? What, what are we doing when we see the power that's in it? So, all right, let me move on. Let me move on. In answer to the question, should we as Christians fast? Yes, we should. We should. Number three, the purpose of fasting. All right, the purpose of fasting. Fasting, A, needs to center on God. It's all about the focus. It's all about why we're doing what we're doing. God is always about the motivation. It's, it's always about what he sees, and what he sees is our heart. So he knows why we do what we do. Not only does he know what you've said and what you've thought and what you've done, if the motivation of your heart is correct, that's a blessing. If the motivation of your heart is not correct, I don't care if your mother Teresa, Gandhi, and Big Bird all wrapped up into one entity. I don't care how holy you think you are. If your motivation wasn't right, God doesn't care. It's worthless. It's for nothing. You get it? But I can, you mean, you mean to tell me all that good that people maybe, you know, gave away my, yeah, listen, Steve Jobs, 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 whatever his name is, Steve Jobs, right? He might have given away millions, millions in taking care of the poor and, and poverty as he was getting, because obviously, you know, somebody who's super wealthy like that is, is going to be a philanthropist because they want the tax breaks or whatever. But guess what? If he didn't accept Jesus, he's not in heaven. Period. Period. There's no two ways about this because God knows the motivations of our heart. All right, let me move on. So it has to focus on God. Fasting has to focus on God. Zechariah talks about this in chapter 7. God asks them the question because they were fasting. And he asks them, did you fast unto me? Who are you fasting for? It's not for me. God said that. Fasting humbles us. Fasting humbles us. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're at work. You're not just skipping lunch. You're taking the time during that time when you're skipping that meal. You take the time to find a place to pray. Find a place to focus. The idea behind fasting is that you acknowledge, God, I'm human and my, my frame is but dust, as you know. And I am fragile and I'm humbling myself. And I'm literally, I'm going to fast. I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to drink water. And you know what that does? It does a couple things. Thing one, it makes you mad. It makes me, I'm a, I'm a cranky, hungry person. Anybody else like that? It's not important right now. Let's move on. That's one of the things it does, though, is that. But the other thing that it does is it reminds me how frail I am. It reminds me how much flesh I am. It reminds me that my God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything to sustain him. But I do. I do. I'm flesh. I'm weak. I'm easily, easily damaged. Easily damaged. I've had some experiences in different jobs, as you know. I've worked at hospitals. I've worked in a chemotherapeutic waste department. I've worked in funeral homes. And I've even worked as a pastor doing funerals after that day. And I got to tell you, there have been times where I've gone to something or seen something and thought to myself, Gosh, how do people even stay alive? We're so fragile. Honestly, there have been times where I look at people and I've seen, a, whether it's an incident or an accident or the aftermath or whatever, and I think, Lord, we're so delicate. Humans, are, I, don't care if, I don't care if you're 6'5 and packed full of muscle. We're delicate. We're delicate. It's easy to get hurt. It's easy to lose, lose this mortal coil. Right? It's easy. And that's not God. God is immeasurable. And the funny thing is that fasting reminds me about all that. It reminds me, hey, guess what? Remember, you're, you're weak. You're weak. You're, you, you're fragile. 
And that act of humbling myself before God, you know what it does? Stirs them up. Listen, Julian can come to me or Jaden or Andrea and say, and say, I, I, I need a, you know, I need a, I need a new, I, I need a new PS4 game. Like, yeah, yeah, you don't need a new PS4 game. Yeah, you know, and then when Andrea's done saying that, she's, she'll say, no, I'm kidding. You didn't catch that? Okay, never mind. That'll be Julian. So, uh, but, but let Jaden or Julian or Andrea say, I'm hungry. I have to act. I have to act. I feel compelled. I feel compelled to act. I feel compelled to say, let's get you something to eat. There's something fragile. There's something fragile about that, that just that simple, silly little thought. They're hungry. Uh, maybe it's the Italianness. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't think so. And when my kids come to me and say they're hungry, I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, everyone to battle stations. What do we do? You know, to arms. And I like to, I don't mind cooking either. And so I'm going to make sure that they're not hungry. What do you think it does to God when we intentionally say, Lord, I'm depriving my flesh. I belong to you. I remember, I remember I'm humbling myself. I'm not in charge. You are. You designed me. And I'm going to take my eyes off my own flesh for a second. And I'm going to put my focus on you instead. It's powerful. Powerful. The intention of fasting is for God. It's to God. It's not just skipping a meal. It's find a place to talk to God. And, 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 and tell him why you're doing what you're doing. He knows already. Tell him anyway. Fasting reminds us that he's the sustainer. It reminds us that, that food doesn't sustain us. He does. Listen, Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. You know what it says? In Christ, all things hold together. Did you know that science can try to convince you that between gravity and, and rotational pull, right, and, and inertia and all the way everything is set up, that they can explain, they'll try to tell you they can explain why the minutest molecule in an atom stays together. They can't. They still can't describe accurately what keeps everything together. What's the prime mover? What's the beginning? You know who it is? In Christ all things hold together. That means you and me too. You, you, uh, I, 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 wish, I wish, sometimes I wish you could be in my head because there are certain things that are just so powerful. And in my head, this idea that the entire cosmos is literally just held together because God wills it is amazing. It's amazing. It blows me away. I love stuff like that. I, I, we're going to get into some, some prophecy in a couple months from now. and We're going to get into a little bit of the creation versus evolution. Uh, it's amazing that by the power of God's hand, life is here. It's not, it, listen, it's not that it's not scientific. It's that God invented the science and he controls it in his hand. Listen, you could talk to, you could talk to whatever genius you want to. And they will try to explain away how that tiny molecule at the very center, the nucleus, holds together. But they can't. At the end of the day, it is the power of God that keeps everything together. That's amazing. Every molecule in your body. Your body still, it, with all the technology that we face today, 2019. Wow, 2019. Who's made a mistake? Tell the, tell the truth. Who's already made a mistake and written 2018? Wow. What? You're fired. No. <laughs> Listen, it's 2019. And with the most advanced computers in the world, you, you know, it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long. Hold up your wrist. You have your watch on? Yeah. Hold up your wrist for a second. Just hold it up. Everybody see that? That's an iPhone watch. Now, did he need that or did he want that? No, that's not one. That's not my point. No, no. Lift it up. Lift it up. Listen to me. There's more technology in that dumb little watch than used to be contained in rooms this size on a computer. The, the technology then fits in that little watch. If God were to pick you up and drop you in the past, Doctor Who style, if you're into that, uh, it, it, they, would, they, would, they would think it was black magic. They really would. In fact, there's a little theory about that. 
There's a little talk about that that says anything you can't explain, you know, it's, it's too mystical, it's too magical, oh, it's science, and eventually we'll understand it. I got news for you. We will understand it when we're in heaven. And you see, and you see the tremendous power that God wields. All right, let me move on. In Christ, all things hold together. Why? Why all of that? All of that, all of that to say, Christ sustains me, not food. Fasting is an opportunity to show him that, to tell him that. Wow. Fasting helps bring balance. Fasting helps bring balance. It does. Fasting, depriving myself of anything, brings balance. How, how often do the non-essentials, and I'm asking you this, that's rhetorical, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to ask yourself this. How often do non-essential things in your life have control of your life? I want you to think about that for a second. How often do non-essential things take up all of your time, all of your money, all of your energy, all of your focus, all of your resource? How often are those things poured into things that are not essential? That's a, that's a big question to ask ourselves. How often do we want things that we don't need, as I said earlier? How often does everything else except God control me? Fasting helps us keep our, our, our world in check, which is why it's very, very, very healthy for us to fast, not just from food, but even from other things. I've got a challenge for you. It's coming. It's coming. I got news for you. If you don't watch the news on TV or on your, face, you know, on your Facebook or the media or on your laptop, on your iPad or whatever, what, if you don't watch it for a month, nothing's going to change. I promise you, if you ignore social media and the news and TV and even the weather, you'll figure it out. Look, it's really easy. You see what I'm doing? I'm just pantomiming for you. This is the way to do it. It's, I'm like, this is a, a modern day app. This is, I'm, it's like a physical app. Like, open the door, look outside, and that's the weather, right? Now, listen, the world will not stop rotating because you took yourself out of the loop. It won't, I promise you, it won't. It's a good idea to fast some other junk that takes up all of our time. I walk into a bank. Everybody's like this. God forbid you should say hello to somebody standing next to you. You walk into the grocery store. People. Somebody crashed into another lady this week. This week. Two carts came together. Bang. Both of them on their cell phones. Hilarious. Shop right. This one. It doesn't happen in Berlin. They're just smarter than that there. No, I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm just joking. Don't get angry. I'm just joking. Literally, two, two ladies are, are walking along, and they clinked. Uh, Julian's not in the room right now. He's in the back. And they clinked carts because neither one of them is looking where they're going. I thought it was hilarious. In fact, I almost put it in the sermon, and then I didn't, but now it fits. So here it is. I, 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 I just I don't understand why we're so... Listen, it's a good thing to fast from social media and even from politics and the news and the TV for a season. I promise you, the world will not stop. It will not stop. And finally, among other things, and this is really important right now. This is really important right now. I need to check the time. We're good. Fasting brings power. Fasting brings power. We like, we like to think that we have all the power that God's given us. And he has. He's given us a lot of authority. We, we speak and act, we can do things in his name. We can move in, 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 in we and we can act in the strategy of the Holy Spirit. That's a lot. That's a lot of power. But we don't use it much. I've always been intrigued by this. I've always been intrigued by this. You know, your brain, your brain is only like so much percentage used. And science has for many, many years been trying to figure out what's all this ability in the brain that it's not, that, that, that's not used. Now, some of us are thinking, oh, I, I, need every, I need every cell up here for what I do, and it's already not working. But there's, there's a scientific fact that you only use a certain percentage of your brain. I don't know why that is. I don't know if God is storing something in there for us. I don't know. I'm not sure, but it does amaze me that we don't use 
all that we have. I have no idea. Maybe it was, maybe we used more of it when we lived longer because in the Old Testament, they were living five, six, seven, eight hundred years. They were living a long time. Maybe that's part of it, the canopy effect and, and before the flood and everything changed and then, you know, the ozone changed and that's a whole different sermon, which we'll talk about. That's fun stuff too, but, uh, but I, do, I do often think, you know, I'll bet you we have more spiritual ability and power than we know as well. And we're not using it, we're not walking in it, we're not acting in it. And so the New Testament teaches this in the Synoptic Gospels, right? Here's what it says. The Synoptic Gospels, the Gospels that match. Matthew, Mark, you'll, you'll find the same story in Matthew that you would in Luke. And you'll find a different rendition of, of the story in Luke, in Mark. You know what I'm saying? The Synoptic Gospels, that's all that means. But you'll find this repeated. And the story is that a man comes to Jesus to have his child delivered of demonic possession. And when he comes to Jesus, he says, listen, Jesus, you're, can you deliver my child of this, of this demonic possession? Because your disciples can't. Your disciples can't. And so Jesus says, well, this, this kind, this kind, which tells you it's real. There are demons and there is a devil and he hates you and he wants to destroy you. It's not, it's not child's play. It's not a joke. We don't see it. Doesn't mean it's not real. There's a lot we don't see. We don't see the principles of darkness. We don't see the realms all around us where there's angels and, 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 and the demonic and, and God moving to protect you and love you and do things for you without us even knowing. I love that. I love that I don't have to worry about that because God is my buffer. I love that. So here's this demon-possessed boy, and Jesus says, oh, I, I can deliver him, but the reason they couldn't is because this kind of demon can only come out by prayer and fasting. What does that, what does that mean? It means power comes with fasting. There's a power there. It's not my power. I'm not like, if I fast, I get to be a superhero. There's a big, you know, a, a, a big cheeseburger with a, like a, a thing through it or whatever. No, that's not... It's not my, but it's God's power moving through me because I stirred his heart up by, by, hum, by, by humbling myself before him. All of that belongs to you. Do you get that? All of that belongs to you and I. All that power, all that authority. And I don't say this in an arrogant way. All of what Jesus has for you is there if I live right if I live right, if I'm, if I'm humbling myself before him, I'm not talking about, well, there, you're, don't, don't sit there and think, oh, there goes me then. I'm not, listen, no, I didn't say perfect. If we walk humbly and in repentance and in the power of the Holy Spirit with all of our flaws, with all of our foibles, with all of the junk that we struggle with, right? Every day I'm praying, God, forgive me, I did it again. Oh, I did it again. I bought another bag of peanut M&Ms. I ate the whole thing, whatever. I'm just saying, I'm just using that as an example. That actually doesn't happen. Buffalo wings? That's another story. So here's the thing. Listen, we have all of this power that God wants to equip you with. And all, I, all he asks me to do is walk in repentance. Walk in humility. Talk to me. Walk in forgiveness and the grace that I gave you and in the power and in the authority. But we're all just so, where's Peter? Is Peter in here? Uh, we were just talking about this the other day. We were just talking about this yesterday, right? We're so busy. Busy has become a dirty word to me. I don't, it's not an excuse and it's not valid. And if I'm too busy, something's got to change. Because God deserves more of me. Period. End of story. God deserves more of you. He does. He does. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Listen, you have the authority that Christ gave us to heal, to set people free from bondage, to change your world, and yes, even to share your faith, even to be an evangelist where you're like, man, I, bar I barely got a hold of this thing myself. I barely got my own mind wrapped around this salvation thing, and you want me to go tell somebody else? Yes, I do. It'll change you. It'll strengthen you. And fasting is a part of that, that power that he gives you to do that. Just a really quick, a personal illustration. I talked about this a little bit last week. Uh, I talked about this a little bit last week about Andrea and I having so many troubles, so many problems to have children. It was a miracle. Both of our children are miracles, right? One of the hardest things about being in ministry is this, that we have to set an example, Pastor Ben, whether we want to or not. Whether we, want, well, whether we feel like it or not, we're still setting an example. Don't everybody go shave your head. I'm just saying. 
We, whether, you, whether you wake up happy, except, except Bill, <laughs> you're looking good. <laughs> Listen, whether, you're, whether you're happy or sad or you're facing some tragedy and all of that, you still, you still have to present not a fake smile, a real one is genuine. But you almost have to convince yourself, God, I know what I'm going through, but I know that you're faithful and there's people watching me. That's huge. And before you say, wow, Pastor, that sounds tough. Yeah, it's not just for me, folks. It's not. It's for all of us who are setting an example for people that are watching us. I've had the opportunity over the years to mentor young people. You know, mentor young, young, you know, young, young guys. Always, always guys. To, to mentor young guys. And honestly, I, I was trying to do the math yesterday and thinking up different names of the people that I had spent some time with, both at Glad Tidings at Reading and in, in, in Kearney at West Hudson Christian Center and even at CBC in Springfield. I had, I had these young guys that I was, you know, I'd talk with them and meet with them and several of them accepted the Lord for me just spending some time with them. And some of them got interested in scripture. Well, I'll tell you something. One of my favorite questions to ask them one of my favorite questions to ask them when they would say, I want to go into ministry was, is there anything else you enjoy doing? Is there anything else you could see yourself good at? And yeah, it was a trick question. It was. You know why? Because if there was anything else they could see themselves doing, go do that instead. Go do that instead. Because when you enter into ministry and then, and then all hell breaks loose, and I mean that sincerely, literally. And then all hell breaks loose. You will run back to what you like to do and what you were good at and where your confidence rests. That's what will happen. Out of all of those people I've ever mentored, one of them is still in ministry. One of them is in ministry today, thriving. The real deal. That's not a light, I don't say that lightly. And I don't say that because it's a pastor thing. I say that because we have to set an example, and I'm not alone in this. Because if you're a Christian, guess what? You're shepherding someone. You're shepherding someone. You may not be called to lead a church, but you're called to shepherd someone. You're called to evangelize that person. You're called to, to encourage that person, to talk to them about Jesus, to share your life with them. You are called to shepherd that person. And I'll tell you, they're watching you, whether you think that they are or not. And I know some of, you, some of us might, you know, some of us might be facing tragedy or, or depression or anxiety or financial stuff. Or, and some of you are like, yep, keep going, all of those, yep. I know, I know it's not easy, but guess what? It is your demeanor and it is your countenance and it's with your words and your heart and your actions that the people around you will see what you're going through and say, wow. They still have peace. They still have joy. They still trust their God. You don't think that's powerful? Powerful. Well, uh, Pastor, I, I don't have that. I don't have that. That's why we're talking about fasting. Because it comes from that. It comes from that. It's not a magic pill. It's not. It's not a button that you press. You don't get to tell God what to do. Listen, in closing, fasting... Fasting does not tie God's hands to do your will. I put this on Facebook, and then I thought, that was pretty good. So I quoted myself, and I wrote it on here too. And this is true, though. Fasting does not tie God's hands to do my bidding. It doesn't. It's not a formula in to include God into my will. We don't invite Jesus to be a part of our existence. It's not how it works. None of it. Fasting admits my frailty, my fragility to God. It draws us toward him and it stirs his heart towards us so that we can be a part of his will. That's the way it works. I sat in my living room this morning at 4.30 in the morning. I was sitting there, 4.30 in the morning. The onions were already sauteing for the sauce that's going on your meatballs. And so I sat there and I looked around my house. and It's a beautiful house. I'm not being prideful. I looked around and thought, God, how did I get here? I do this often. I do it often. I keep reminding myself of that. I'll never stop doing that. And I thought, you are so good. You are so faithful. And every tragedy I've overcome has been through God. Every, every obstacle that I've gotten through has been because of God. 
Everything that I've made it past, everything that seemed insurmountable has always been because there's a God that loves me that's holding the whole universe together with his hand and I'm in it. Relationship problems, marital problems, financial problems, physical problems. It doesn't matter what it is. Fill in the blanks. I've got a problem, Pastor, with my son. My daughter's addicted to whatever. It doesn't matter. God is still God. And if you're saying, where do I get the power you're describing so that I can do what it is you're suggesting, so that I can be what it is I'm supposed to be, I'm saying the answer to that is fasting in addition to prayer, in addition to the word. Listen, we're fasting together this week. We're fasting together this week. I got to calm down. Or if Lauren, if Lauren Bushy were in the room, she'd say, you're being sassy. I'll stop. I'm going to calm down. I don't even know what sassy means, honestly. Listen, f- when, we, when we deprive ourselves and humble ourselves before God and say, God, I want more. I want Jesus, I want more. Holy Spirit, I want more. I want more. I want more sympathy. I want more compassion. I need more wisdom. I need more discernment. I need it all. I need more. I want more. I want more of you. I want more intimacy with you. I want, and when you humble yourself and you take a day or two or three to fast and you use that time to pray and seek God and just say, God, I, I don't, I'm not even sure what I'm doing. You understand, you don't have to be a theologian to do this. Your prayer can actually be, God, I'm really not sure what I'm doing, but, I, but I'm hungry and, I'm, and I just bit my neighbor's head off because I'm crabby because I haven't eaten anything. Even crab sounds good right now, right? Let, let, when you're in that position, your friend, you know what you've done? You have inclined your heart to God. You've, you, you've debased yourself. God, I'm human and I need your help. And I'm fasting so that I acknowledge how frail I am, how weak I am without you. I can't do this without you. And when you do that, when you do that, God raises you up. He lifts you up. Because in that motion, in that motion of inclining your heart to God, he sees a child reaching out for help, humbling themselves. And he pours himself into you. And what comes with it? What comes with all of his compassion and his mercy? What comes with it? Power. Power. Power to break free of things you can't break free of. Power to trust him to take you through situations you can't know. You can't know if you're going to get through. All of that comes with it. So yes, fasting. Okay. Listen, we're fasting. We're going to start tomorrow. We're starting tomorrow not because of the meatball sandwiches. We're starting tomorrow because that's the schedule. That's what we thought we would do. (laughs) It wasn't, it wasn't to trap you and trap you into into eating a meatball sandwich in the car, (laughs) in the back seat with the lights off. Uh, Eat today, if you, unless you're already fasting. We're going to start tomorrow. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Everybody in here. If you're experienced If you're experienced at fasting and you know what it means to deprive yourself of food and just drink water for the express intention of stirring God's heart, it might be because you're going through a situation. It might be to address a problem you're having. It might be just from greater intimacy. It might be just to honor him because honoring him and loving him, that's really the fundamental purpose of fasting is to draw closer to God. And then all the other stuff is sort of peripheral and it's, it's there. And you could certainly bring those things to him. But if you're experienced at it, we're doing Monday through Friday. Tomorrow, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we will be fasting. Let's say you've never done this before. And and you're not sure how that's going to go. And you don't want to fail God. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to. And by the way, I got to tell you this. For those of you who haven't fasted before, you know, if, if you start fasting and tomorrow at 1130, a Chips Ahoy cookie comes into your mouth. Like you're not going straight to hell. Just honor God. Honor God. Just do your best. Do your best. Uh, I would never say, you might be diabetic. You might have issues, hypoglycemic, whatever. If you have stuff like that, I wouldn't tell you don't, you know, be careful. Use wisdom. Use wisdom. But use God. Pray. Ask him. Ask him what he wants you to do. If you can fast all three days, fine. If you can't, on Wednesday morning, Wednesday morning, from the time we wake up, 
to the time we get to church, we're not going to eat. And what I'm asking you, and I'm asking you two other things in addition, but let's finish the first one. On Wednesday evening, if you're able to join us, we're going to have a brief devotional, and then we're going to break our fast together. And I promise there will be healthy things like cheese and sauce on crust that's baked in the oven. There might even be a salad present. Listen, we're going to break our fast together. Pizza. It's pizza. And some of you are like, what? Pizza. Okay, never mind. It's all right. <laughs> so, and there might be salad as well um, on Wednesday. And so join us for that. And we'll break our fast together after a devotional on Wednesday. Listen, the other thing that I want to ask you is this. We are pressing in. We are pressing in. I want more of God. I want more for me. I want more for you. I want more for the church. I do. So tonight is the awakened prayer service where we worship for a time period and then we pray together. Will you, will you please come out and join us? It's an hour long. It's not going to take a lot of your time it's from six to seven. Join us tonight. This is the, basically, this is the kickoff to our fasting week. And, and I'm just asking if you're able to be here, that you join us so that we can literally, we're going to be praying for a number of different things, but my, my, my intent, my focus, my goal for this evening is to pray that we would stir the heart of God, that he would draw us closer to him, all of us individually and as a unit. So if you're not doing something and if you're, I mean, you might go home and start fasting and praying for the Eagles game at 4.30. It's fine, but come back at six. Come back at six and join us this evening. Amen. Can we stand? We're going to pray. Before I pray, I'm going to say this. Next week, next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching this. And this is not a joke. It's going to sound like, a, it's going to sound like it needs a punchline, but it doesn't have one. Next week, my sermon will be on remembering the sermon. Remembering the sermon. Because you know what? I have, I have experienced over and over that when people are here and they're all stirred up and they're excited... And they're moved and they're motivated and God is, God is speaking to your hearts. I know that he is. I know the Holy Spirit's speaking to some of your hearts because that's what he does, right? But the minute we leave the room, it's all gone. It's all gone. Now I'm hungry. Now I'm thinking about something else. I get in the car. We have an argument about where we're going to eat in the car. The whole sermon is just out the window. I'm just saying it's, uh, next week we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about retaining what God is speaking into our heart because I think it's important and I think it'll change the way that you think. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, today we do humble ourselves and we, God, we acknowledge that we are frail. We are frail. We are flesh um, and we are precious to you. We are precious to you and we are loved. And so, Father, as we humble ourselves, we also, we also through your eyes and through your words, you lift us up. And we acknowledge that. Your people are kings and queens in your eyes. You lift them up. You bless them. You give them, you give us authority. You protect us. You bless, you anoint. God, I ask that you would use our words to bring healing and life and peace and love to the people around us. And God, if there's somebody here this morning who's struggling, who's discouraged, depressed, facing anxiety, facing a medical issue, facing whatever it is we're facing, I pray, God, that we would remember that we are surrounded by your, and, 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 and by your presence and we are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that. God, I pray a blessing and a protection over your people. When we go out, when we come in, God, I pray, draw us closer to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.